Every day we chant that we take the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha as our refuge. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that we are hoping for the Buddha to come and help us. The Buddha entered nirvana a long time ago. As for the Sangha, they may not be around when we need them. What we need is a refuge inside that goes with us everywhere we go. And that's what the Buddha meant when he t talked about taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. Now, if we take the Buddha, his Dharma, and the Noble Sangha as examples of how to live, how to look after our minds. And then we internalize those lessons. We put them into practice. We take the skills that they've mastered and we try to master them ourselves. Like the skills dealing with the breath, skills, skills in developing mindfulness and concentration. Trying to develop a, a spot inside, in the breath energy in the body where the breath feels good going in, feels good going out. The quality of the breath energy in the body feels good. Everything is flowing smoothly. As you get to know the energy in the body, you'll begin to realize there are certain spots that are like crossroads in the energy. Where the channels of the energy come together and then spread out again. If you focus on one of those, like the spots that John Lee mentions in his book, the base of the throat, the middle of the chest, above the navel, you're trying to keep that spot going well. And if anything happens to the breath energy in that spot, you know something's happened either in the body or in the mind. You can use that as your barometer. To tell you, okay, there's there's danger. Either something's out of balance in the body, or there's greed, aversion, and delusion have arisen in the mind. And things have gotten tight suddenly in that spot. Well, the first reaction should be to open it up again, breathe in a way that opens the spot. Then look at your mind. What's happened in the mind? What did you just do? Or what did somebody else do that you reacted to? What can you do to make sure that you don't carry the the defilement around, either the greed or the aversion or the delusion. How do you not carry that around? Otherwise, things happen in the course of the day and your mind is like a garbage pail. People that just throw all kinds of garbage in and you come home and you've got nothing but garbage inside. And the first person you meet, you just pour the garbage out. That's not a good way to live. A much better way is to think of the garbage pail having a big hole in the bottom so that everything just goes right through, right through. In other words, you know what they're saying. You know what people are doing, but you don't take it as, a, as, as something you're going to focus on. You keep breathing easily, breathing easily no matter what. That opens the bottom of the garbage pan, so you're not carrying things around. But the thing is, it's not just what other people do, it's also what you do that can also cause problems to make you lose your spot, lose your awareness, lose your mindfulness of the spot. Two big issues have to do with the precepts and with restraint. When you break any of the precepts, it's like a it's like a wound in the mind. Then when you sit down to meditate, either you have an open wound, which you're very sensitive about and it's very uncomfortable to settle down in the present because you think about the harm you did, or it can be like one of those wounds that a lot of scar tissue develops around it. It doesn't heal properly, and you just got a lot of knot of scar tissue, and that's, that stands for denial. You go into denial about what you've done. Either way, it's not good for getting the mind to settle down in the present and to see itself. Because if you hit the wound, the mind recoils. If you run into scar tissue, you don't really know what's there because it's all hardened. So for the mind to be open to itself, and particularly for your mindfulness to be able to remember things for long periods of time. You want to make sure that the precepts, your precepts, are solid as you go through the day. And of course, practicing the precepts gives you practice in mindfulness and alertness. You have to keep the precepts in mind and you're alert to what you're doing to see if what you're doing might go against the precepts. Those qualities then help your meditation. So it's important to see that the precepts are there as part of the meditation. They're not just something you happen to get picked up as 
Buddhism came from the Buddha into our time. They're, they're an important part of training the mind in the qualities you need in order to get the mind to be able to look after itself. It's the same with restraint. Now, restraint is of two, type, two types. One is restraint of your mouth, what you say as you go through the day. You want to make sure that it's true and beneficial and timely. You went to all the trouble of becoming a human being with a human mouth that can express things. So take care of your mouth. As John Lee used to say, bow down to your mouth every day. You've got this mouth that can do all kinds of good things. Well, use it to do good things. Even when you're trying to be humorous, make sure that your humor is true and beneficial. The principles of right speech don't mean that you have to be stern and serious all the time, but they do mean that you have to be careful about how you express your humor. That's one kind of restraint. The other kind of restraint is on what you bring in through your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body. Be careful about how you look at things, how you listen to things, because it's the how that makes all the difference. There are things out there that could very easily incite passion or anger, but it's possible to look at them in ways where it doesn't incite passion and doesn't incite anger. Like with the human body. There are some bodies that are really attractive if you look at them in the normal way. But if you start thinking about what's inside the body, you apply a different perception. And that'll cut through a lot of the passion you might otherwise feel. So you want to look at how you're looking at things, how you're listening, who's doing the looking, who's doing the listening. Is greed doing the looking? Is anger doing the listening? You want to take your ears and your eyes back from them so that what you look at and what you listen to doesn't destroy your sense of the center here in the body, where how you look, how you listen doesn't destroy these things. And John Lee's example is examples of a house. When you have a house, you know when to open the doors and windows and when to close them, who to let in, who not to let in. You also know what you should be sending out into the neighborhood and what you should keep inside the house. But most of us, our minds are not like houses, they're like bus stations. All kinds of things happen in bus stations because anybody can come in, anybody can go out. Drugs are being sold in the bathrooms, who knows what's going on inside there. You want to chase everybody out and then let in only the things that will be helpful and send out from that point on only things that will be helpful to the world. And this helps you maintain that sense of the center that needs to be protected, needs to have a sense of balance. As you maintain that center, it gives you a grounding as you go through the day. You have, you're coming from a position of strength, a position of solidity. That makes it a lot easier to do the right thing, think the right thing, say the right thing. Because you have a sense of well-being inside. Most of the time when we find that we're easily angered, it's because we don't feel good inside. We've been breathing in a way that's not helpful. And nobody's forced us to breathe in a way that's not helpful, it's just that we've not paid attention to our breathing. That gets us irritated, and then the irritation spreads out from there. So if you're going to maintain a sense of having a comfortable center inside, your sensitive point inside that you care for, regardless of whatever else is going on, you'll find that that sensitive point actually becomes a position of strength. This is true not only as we go through life, but as life ends. You need to have a sense of a firm foundation when the mind realizes it can't stay with the body anymore. In Thailand, during, when they have funerals, they'll usually print some books and there'll be a little biography of the people who passed away. When you read the biographies, they tend to follow the same pattern. The person was born, grew up, got educated, had a family life. children, maybe grandchildren, and then after a while begin to have a, 
a little disease here, a little disease there. And at first the doctors were able to take care of it, but then as things got more and more serious, there came a point where the doctors couldn't help anymore. And then the person died. And the point always there is, what are you going to do when the doctors can't help anymore? Who are you going to look to then? If you've developed a refuge inside, that becomes your refuge then. This is the only kind of thing that you can depend on then, i.e. the good qualities you've developed in the mind. The ability to keep your mind centered regardless of what's going on around you. Like this um, skill we've been developing here as we meditate. Thoughts come up in the mind, but you don't have to pay them any attention. One of the best ways of dealing with distraction is not to try to chase the distractions down and erase them. It's just to leave them be, but not get interested. And after a while, they'll go away. Because at the point where you, find, you realize you're going to be leaving the body, lots of things are going to come rushing into the mind. And so you have to be able to say, nope, I'm not going to go for those things. Things that you did in the, during the past, incidents in your life will appear to you. Places where you may go after you die may appear to you sometimes good, sometimes not good. And you have to remember, you have the choice. You don't have to go with whatever appears. So when events in, in your life come up that you feel regret for, you don't have to get pulled down in regret. Or if some very unpleasant place appears, you don't, you don't have to go there. You have the choice. You're going to stay right here in the present moment and don't go running out after whatever appears. So the skill we're developing here is a useful skill, this skill of having your place here in the present moment, feeling at home in the present moment, looking after your home in the present moment. Even if the point comes where you can't focus on the breath anymore because you're leaving the body, at least you've got this home in the present moment in the mind, just with your awareness in the present moment. That becomes your refuge. That's what's meant by Taking the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha is our refuge, is practicing these skills. So you can depend on yourself. So look after this skill. It can help you through life, it can help you through death, it can help you as you stay, and it can help you as you go. It's hard to find any other skill like this in the world. So make sure you care for it. Look after your spot inside. Look after the breath inside. That's what keeps you anchored in the present moment. That's what gives you a sense of solidity as you go through life, and solidity even when you have to leave the body. Because your sense of being here, totally in the present, that's what's going to give you the strength to withstand anything negative that appears or it seems ready to pull you away. You can stand your ground. and come out unscathed.